welcome to this week's Q&A. So like any other week, if you want a chance to want any questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. So the first question of the week it is, uh, should you replace or should you resurface your rotors? And that really depends on what you want to do. Uh, at our dealership, we try to resurface rotors if we can, every time, if possible, just to keep the costs down. Uh, now, some rotors you can't resurface if they're stamped on Honda's and Acura's FNC, then they're not resurfaceable. Um, now, again, we try to resurface these rotors as often and as much as possible for need and replacement, as long as they're within spec after the resurfacing is done. And uh, usually that's about one to three times, depending how deep we need to go to get the rotor nice and true and nice and clean up from either rust or some, you know, a buildup on there or whatever the case may be. So obviously uh, this comes, uh, you know, at a cost if you do just the uh, rotor resurfacing, it's just labor. If you replace the rotors, then you would have to pay for the pads and the rotors at that time. Really depends on which way you wanna go about. Some people like resurfacing, some people like replacing, some people don't believe in doing anything, but just putting new pads on, uh, you know, which is fine as well if you're okay with that and whatever comes attached to that scenario. So personally, uh, we do resurface rotors as much as possible uh, just to keep the cost down for the consumer. But if you're doing a, a job at home yourself, uh, you won't have access to a brake lathe and replacing those rotors is fine uh, with that brake job as well. So hopefully that answers this question for you. Question of the week, it is uh, why is Honda still using time belts? And Honda only uses time belts on their J series. Uh, everything else is timing chain. So the J series is on their bigger vehicles like the TLX, the MDX, uh, Odyssey, uh, Pilot, the new Passport coming out, uh, etc. etc. So uh, Honda has had three different variations of these time belts. The original one, which was probably about an inch thick, inch and a half. Uh, the secondary one, which is still on most vehicles, which is about three quarters of the size of the original one. And now the uh, newest engines with the dual overhead cams actually have uh, time belts still and it's just a whole different design. Although the blocks essentially have been the same design with some minor changes here and there, along with the heads, they've had a couple of different versions of heads and stuff like that, with the most recent version being the dual overhead cam setup. Now, if they went to a timing chain setup, it would require a ton of modifications to the crank, the block, the oil pumps, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for that reason, they chose to keep the time belts. Yes, this has come at a cost to the consumer, but at the end of the day, it works. Uh, you know, it's been a proven design for decades and decades from Honda. And at this point of the uh, time frame that we are in, where these ICE engines are probably coming to an end within the next decade or so, best case scenario, uh, I don't think it would make sense for Honda to invest and make a whole new um, you know, engine series just to accommodate a timing change. So I think it's just basically something they're doing to uh, protect their uh, investment, try to you know, uh, not spend as much money on R&D if they don't have to. And again, it's something that works. Unfortunately, it does come at a price to the consumer, but we've seen timing chains fail as well. Now they don't need regular maintenance like time belts do, but we have seen some fail, especially from neglected engines. So hopefully that answers the question for you. So this next question is why do uh, batteries on newer vehicles seem to die a lot quicker than older ones would? So uh, just for starters, these newer vehicles have a ton more systems that continue to run after the vehicle is turned off uh, for moments, uh, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes after the vehicle is turned off. Also, I see a lot of people also hanging out in their vehicle, key on, engine off, and obviously putting some strain on that battery. Now, um, all that in addition to cold and hot and extreme temperatures obviously take a toll. But I think also the auto start stop system or stop start systems definitely takes a toll on the batteries as well. And in a perfect world, it wouldn't, but unfortunately it does. And again, people like to sit in cars for whatever reason, uh, maybe contemplate life or whatever it is. And I think that also plays a factor into these batteries dying Unfortunately, it's just, it is what it is. You know, uh, back, if you go backwards 20 years or so, uh, it was just simple uh, circuits, simple stuff. You shut off the key, the car is off. That is no longer the case nowadays. And I believe that definitely plays a huge factor. If your battery is three years old, please have it tested, especially if you're in extreme cold or extreme hot weather. They take a toll on these batteries for sure. 
three years old, I've replaced them on my cars, no questions asked, because chances are when these batteries die, it's going to be at the absolute worst time. So three years old, start testing them seriously, uh, at least two to three times a year, uh, you know, preferably every oil change that you do, test them. And if there's any signs of slow cranking or anything like that, for sure get them tested. And three years old, three to five years, do not wait any longer than five years to replace your battery. So hopefully that answers this question for you. Question is, what could be uh, some problems with uh, vibrations in vehicles? And vibrations could come from many different things. And uh, some of them could include um, tires being out of round or shifted belts, some bent wheels, uh, also some axle vibrations that could come oftentimes from um, the axles themselves, the inner joints having some uh, flat spots in them or some high spots causing these issues. And that usually happens under medium to harsh acceleration. When you let off the gas pedal, it goes away. Now, if you're just driving along and everything seems okay, and I actually had this happen to me the other day, I had wheels, they look good, they wouldn't balance, and ended up being that this car had fix a flat in it. So that could be an issue itself. There's obviously other stuff that plays factors in it. Sometimes if it's on a particular road, it could be that road itself. Uh, but just some of the things for you to check, if you've added fix a flat or anything like that to that nature and you get weird vibrations, I would definitely check that. If you have a uh, hub that's out of a round or bent, then obviously that could cause some vibrations as well. Uh, uh, bad wheel bearing ha would have noises and vibrations. Um, really depends. If you're having something on a steering wheel around 60, 65, 70, that's typically a wheel balancing issue at that point. So really depends on what you're feeling. Um, but first things first, tires, wheels, that comes into contact with the road. And that's something that nine out of 10 times is the issue. So hope it answers the question for you. Last but not least, question of the week. And once again, if you want a chance to wait questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. So the last question is, idling in the summer versus idling in the winter. So either one of those really shouldn't be uh, being practiced on a daily basis. But if I had to choose one, I would say idling in the summer is a better answer. Just for the simple fact that these direct injection vehicles, which most of them are nowadays, do seem to have a harder time and accumulate oil dilution in colder temperatures for the simple fact that they aren't at operating temperature. Now, with these recalls that we've been doing, the 10 to 13 hours, and this is more specific, the hybrids, um, that we have to let them run for those 10 to 13 hours. After those 10 to 13 hours are ran, we have to do a test with a fuel uh, meter. And essentially what happens is it has to be at a, semper, a certain temperature. And guess what happens? After 10 to 13 hours, it's never at that certain temperature, which is an issue. So, um, and this is more to the hybrid engines, but even normal vehicles in extreme temperatures could have a hard time reaching that, you know, running temperature, which is an issue specifically for that oil dilution. So um, if I had to choose, once again, I would say that uh, warmer temperatures, although when we are running these cars, they are inside the shop just because of the area and we cannot have these cars running outside because the area cannot be trusted with the vehicle running outside. Now, again, if I had to choose, I would say warmer weather, but if you could avoid running your car for extended periods of times, uh, idling outside or whatnot, then uh, I would choose the you know summer, but if you could avoid it at all, I would tell you to avoid it at all. Now in the winter time, obviously nobody likes getting into a cold car. So most of us use remote start, which is perfectly fine. But uh, after you get in the car and it's fully up to temperature, so driving maybe two, three miles, I would definitely recommend maybe just um, you know getting on a car a little bit to make sure it's absolutely up to 100% idling temperature or running temperature because uh, we don't have those numbers at our uh, convenience. Uh, now I can see this obviously with uh, some data, but most people don't have that. So uh, just to try to mitigate this oil dilution issue, I would say try to limit your idle time as much as possible. So with that being said, hope it answers the question for you and I'll catch everyone on the next one.